I hope everybody got a chance to stretch. We've got one last panel. And then you'll be able to... Go home. <laughs> All right, everyone. It's not working. It's not working. It's not, okay. We'll just All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, Alana, when you get a chance, we're, we're trying to use the pointer, and it's not working. The clicker. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so as we're working with that for just a second, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panel moderator who told me, don't say too much about me because this isn't about me, this is about all this great information, but she is pretty amazing. So it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our last panel, Ms. Laura Mitvalski, who is the Director of Health Promotion and Wellness at the Army Public Health Center. This is a very important center, so I'm really excited that she's here. Laura. Well, hello, distinguished uh, military and uh, civilian leaders and distinguished family member leaders. Um, we're really excited to be able to provide you some information about things that you told us last year that you wanted to know, concerns that you had. And so uh, this distinguished panel here is going to uh, tell you a little bit about what we've learned in this last year. So I'm put on my readers. Okay, let's see if this works. And it doesn't. Next slide, please. Great, thank you so much. So um, we're really excited. I think I'm gonna tell you something that most of you in the audience already know, um, but it's a fact that's really important to be said before we actually get to what we wanna talk to you about. So the Army family is a huge group. This room is amazing. And that we have more family members than active duty soldiers. We have 675,000 Army me family members of our active duty soldiers today. So when you look at these slides that I have up here um, in front of you, if we um, kind of look at those numbers, 60% uh, of our active duty soldiers today have a spouse and or children or dependents that, um, that are part of our Army family. And 61% of our soldiers are from families who have served in the military. So we all know that, but when we wanted to have this panel today on healthy, resilient families, there was a new bit of information that came from the Office of People of Analytics, and if I could have the next slide, please, that I think is pretty startling and really a call to action for all of those military leaders in the room. Uh, spousal support is one of the top three predictors, uh, biggest influences of a soldier's intentions to stay in the Army family. Um, I don't know if anyone from Office of People Analytics is in the room, but um, when we started to think about this panel and thinking about what we wanted to do about talking about optimizing the health of the Army family, we know that more, su more support from one's family is, is associated with a higher retention intention and actually higher uh, actual retention. And if I could hit the slide one more time, please. I don't know why I have these builds. So thank you. So when we look at um, this slide right here, 93% of our service members in this Office of People of Analytics study, 93% of service members whose spouses strongly favor staying in the military, that active duty family remains in the military. So let's just say that one more time. 93% of service members whose spouses strongly favor staying in the military I see a face going up and down. Um, those family, those, that active duty soldier stays in the military. So when you think about a readiness and retention issue, I mean, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. So, um, so when we think in that second number there, oh, you hit too fast, but that's okay. Um, I'll just tell you really quickly. We also know that when we ask spouses, about two thirds of Army spouses favor staying and 20% favor leaving. Those aren't the strongly uh, favor, but they favor. So when we think about that 20%, we've got some work to ensure if Army family is really supported. And obviously, that's what this whole um, discussion is about today. So, bottom line more support equals greater retention equals a ready and resilient force. And so, what I'd like to um, to talk about here quickly is that 
it takes, a, it takes a community. It takes everyone in this room. There's so many agencies in the room and online that support the Army family, obviously. And so when we think about the diverse groups at many levels working to improve the health of the Army family, external groups, Army organizations, Army communities, and the heart of this work obviously is our Army family members, no single group can solve the issues facing the health and readiness of our soldiers today, it takes a team effort. And so this group today, this panel, who I'll introduce you to now, are gonna tell you a little bit about that work. So Mr. John Resta, to my left, is the director of the Army Public Health Center. He always tells us that he has 39 years and some months <laughs> working for the government um, at the Army Public Health Center. Um, he was at the Army, uh, he's a DCO acting DCOS Public Health. And as of today, probably about Three hours ago, he just had his first grandchild born, <laughs> Dylan. And although his wife, Eileen, is probably very mad at him, he is here because I said, please, please don't. So he's going to head out to Connecticut, right, I guess, right after this uh, with this uh, panel. And then next to him is Mr. Tim Higdon. Tim is just a phenomenal leader at MCOM. He's um, MCOM G9 family and MWR, and he's the lead for the Healthy Army Communities effort. And you're going to be really excited to hear about what they're trying to do at your military installations to bring health, uh, health, uh, better health options for you on your military installations. And then next to Tim is Dr. Shelley McDermott -Wads Wadsworth. She's from Purdue University, and she's the director of Military Family uh, um, Research Initiative and is going to be sharing some um, really interesting information with you. And then finally, uh, Ms. Elib Elizabeth Groover. She's a professional spouse. She has many of all of you in this room. Uh, she has four children. She's moved numerous times. And just like any amazing Army family spouse, she was actually not our original panel member. So in your, in your agenda, you might see another name. And we called her like yesterday. And she said, sure, I'll do it. And we could have probably pulled any of you up here. But so we really appreciate Elizabeth. Her husband's at the 20th Suburney up at um, Army, uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Resta and uh, let you take it away. Next slide. And I was actually south of the Harbor Tunnel when I found out. <laughs> so I would have had to turn around. Uh, what I'd like to do, next slide please, is, is start with a story. Is uh, about six, seven years ago, I was asked a very simple question by my then boss at the time, Lieutenant General Jorjo, what's the health of the force? And um, the first answer we gave her was, well, it's complicated and it's <laughs> difficult. Um, and that wasn't good enough for her at the time. And so she wanted us to look at that. Well, luckily, again, then, I had somebody else that we were working with, uh, Colonel Dietrich Tahan, who stood up earlier, who was saying, well, we can answer that question. And so we started down that process of trying to assess the health of the force. If I could, uh, next slide, please. Is uh, taking a look at, at what the health of the force is so that we can empower action. We know what illnesses and injuries we suffer from. We know what uh, interventions work and we go forward and actually try and make the force a healthier place. Uh, flash forward to about 2017, my boss at the time, then Lieutenant General, now retired, Nadja West, asked me, well, what about our families? Next slide, please. And at that point, I just assumed 21st century, we have a uh, electronic health record, this is going to be easy. Well, uh, that's not actually true. Again, simple question, complicated answer. Everything we do within health uh, is on a computer. The problem is it's not on a computer, it's on numerous computers, numerous databases. So not everybody gets their uh, health care within a military med medical treatment facility. So we have multiple electronic health records. Uh, not everybody um, has all their data about their children in the systems of record. And oh, by the way, those systems of record are different than the medical records. And health is not really just an absence of sickness or injury, and it's not always represented fully within a medical record. So we are embarking uh, right now, and what we have today for you is essentially version one of, of the Army Health of the Force, and we'll go forward from there and get the version two, three, and four, and get it better as we go forward. So next slide, please. Uh, the first thing, is that uh, we started to look at about a year ago, you all read the news, uh, you talked about it here at this record, regarding uh, blood lead levels in Army children or military children uh, across the country. That caught us a little bit by surprise in the public health community because quite frankly, we thought we had solved that problem in 1996. 
And to a certain extent, we did. We just didn't solve it to our benefit. So since that time, we have been tracking this pretty closely. And now we can tell you with some confidence that Army children have a risk of about five in 1,000 to have an elevated blood lead level. That's about one-fifth to one-fourth the, the actual national averages, depending upon where you live. Uh, depending upon what data are in the system, it's sometimes it's about one one-tenth of the average of national averages. That's still too high. It's too high for us, as, too high for me as a public health professional, uh, simply because this is the 21st century. We know that there are no safe levels of lead in blood. And so we're continuing to progress. We're continuing to look at that and we're continuing to track this. We now actively manage each and every case of elevated blood life within the Army. First quarter of this year, we've had, uh, we had 13 cases. Second quarter, uh, I'm sorry, 16 cases. Uh, second quarter, we had 15 cases out of about 3,100 tests to date. Uh, so we're doing better there, but we're not doing good enough. Our goal is actually zero cases, and we're working that now. If we have the next slide, we know that uh, exposure to lead is, is not um, the only thing that we're worried about. Uh, so we're worried about, a lot of times, vaccine-preventable diseases. We're worried about exposure to lead in other areas. So. Now, 2013, we started looking at child youth services, child development centers in terms of drinking water. Uh, we have, in, in partnership with uh, IMCOM, with the, what is now the Army G9, we've looked at 100% of all facilities that serve children, one lap. We're on our second lap now. Uh, and we've tested all the fountains, uh, the sinks where they use it to make juices and the like. We've tested all those already. And we're sitting there now, we, have a, we had about 4%, 4 out of 100, uh, that had uh, lead above the action level of 15 parts per billion. And in those cases, those sinks, those drinking water fountains, uh, that plumbing were replaced. And so we're in a process now of going around the world, essentially, and checking to make sure that that still happens. We've already looked at 100% of all Army-owned and leased housing. That is not RCI housing. Now that's just Army owned and leased housing. Uh, we had about 14% of those uh, facilities had uh, faucets, sinks, uh, some water supplies that exceeded the uh, action level for lead. And we've gone through, the Army's gone through and replaced those faucets. So we're, we're catching up on that and we're going to start a partnership to start looking at the other Army housing as we go forward. So right now we are leading the country in that regard because the nation does not require this just yet. Uh, there was just a recent regulation for schools. Uh, we're already on our second lap and we're in full compliance with that. We're also looking at things like PFO, PFOS. I don't know if people have heard about that yet. We call that forever chemicals. We've looked at uh, all Army systems. Right now we have 10 systems that exceed the lifetime health advisory for that. And we have taken essentially the contaminated wells offline or put in granular activated carbon treatment systems across the board there. And so we're protecting essentially our sources already now while awaiting the nation to take uh, additional action. Next slide, please. As I talked about, one of the other things we do is uh, we're, we're sitting here and uh, we're concerned about housing. So we, what we did is established an environmental health, a housing environmental health registry uh, where we, uh, Anybody who has an issue associated with housing can call and register. I was uh, troubled a little bit by earlier comments. I'm on a Navy base and they won't help me. Uh, we take sailors, we take Marines, we take airmen, we take Coast Guardmen. We actually take civilians who will call uh, and register their families and ask questions. Uh, as of, this is, oh, those dates, they're already, as of last Friday, we're now 263 families registered. 122 families reported concerns, mold, dampness, standing water. 114 families have requested additional information. 67 of those cases have already been completed. At the same time, what we're doing is tracking exposure to mold. Uh, we've had 107 cases of contact with suspected exposure to mold found in the electronic health record to date. 32 on post mold, on post housing mold assessments were requested associated with that. To, determine what the source of that mold exposure was. Uh, 45 of those assessments were recommended by a health care provider were already initiated in all post housing. So we're sitting there uh, and working through this. This is part of an overall Army housing campaign that you'll hear more about tomorrow 
in uh, Family Forum 4, I think is the number. Uh, but you'll, you'll find out that the Army has already hired in excess of 100 additional people uh, to look at our housing problems. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, we're concerned about preventive health care. I talked about uh, uh, child development centers. One of the things that uh, we're very serious about is that if you're aware of, there's currently a measles epidemic in the United States. First time we've had a measles epidemic in probably four decades, maybe five decades. Uh, we've looked at that problem associated with child development centers, and the majority, the majority, almost all children uh, that are enrolled in our child development centers are already immunized against measles and other Thank you. And other uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, we're in the process now of trying to track for those children who are not enrolled in our systems. One of the problems I talked about is that uh, those records are on a computer somewhere uh, and they're just not in the same place uh, where we would like to find them every time. So we're in the process of trying to figure a way to reach deep into these records, pull it out, and get a better access to care uh, situation there to sort of what General Place was talking about earlier. I'm confident, given the fact that uh, right now we have 90% of our children uh, basically get all of their well baby checks that receive care in the military health system, which exceeds the national averages almost by a factor of two. And so just that mere fact of access to care means that our children are going to end up having better access, seeking medical care. Now, that does not guarantee that they will be healthier. Access to care is not, it is a metric, but it's not the sole metric. And we have to start looking at other things, and we'll talk about that as we go along in terms of other healthier communities. And with that, Tim. So before you go, Tim, um, thank you, Mr. Resta. I wanted to just bring your attention to uh, on your tables the, what doc, uh, Mr. Resta was talking about. There's a lot of more information we found out in terms of optimizing the health of the Army family. Uh, the whole team at that table, raise your hand over there, Dr. Beamer, Dr. Santo, Dr. Jill Brown, all of them, they were the ones working with, um, I'm gonna say OAXIM, because we all still know that headquarters G9, um, Dory and uh, D and all, the whole team to be able to pull this information together for you. So we put uh, a quite thick report into a really nice uh, infographic. And then in terms of the housing registry, I know Colonel Casto is going to be, who's here in the front, is going to be briefing that tomorrow at the family forum. But right over here to your left uh, is more information in the cards with that number and how to um, um, how to access that housing registry. So that's just on this first table. So okay, Mr. Higdon, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, uh, I'm really excited about the next 45 minutes that I have with you, and hopefully it feels more like 10. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to keep it to that. Hey, in over my 30 years of, of being a, a, either a soldier or a veteran or a civilian, or in my case, a spouse, a father, brother, uncle of a soldier, um, everything that I'm hearing today is just so encouraging about our Army family and what we do. And I'm so proud to be a part of it and proud to be in this journey with you uh, as we go through this. So again, thank you for being here today and being a part of that and then for allowing us uh, to come and share with you a little bit about what we're trying to do on our side uh, to continue down that journey with you. So today I have the honor and privilege to represent a very committed team um, of stakeholders that are willing to um, make improvements on our Army installations to make healthier choices easy. And uh, we're really excited about that, so I'm gonna try to share that with you today the best that I can. So we have a very committed team of stakeholders over the last four years that have really focused on uh, providing some emphasis and some focus on things that have already been done, whether it's our Defense Commissary Agency, um, the Exchange, Army G4 that has a Joint Culinary Center of Excellence and Army Sustainment Command that oversee our dining facilities, uh, Army Public Health Center, and then of course my own MCOM G9 family and MWR, who all together are collaboratively working together to make those improvements and, and to look at what we're doing. But not only that, um, to challenge each other a little bit. You know, it's, there, there was a time where maybe we didn't work so well together as a team. And we've acknowledged that and we've said, you know what, we've got to change that. We've got to come together, we've got to collaborate, and we've got to hold each other accountable a little bit to try to make these improvements. And so I'm excited for the leaders in these organizations that have stood together with me and said, hey, we can do something and we're going to make and affect change. And so, uh, again, very proud of the team and all that they're doing. And again, it's about finding what's possible and uh, putting that change into place. I think we all realize there uh, are several challenges in our community, um, 
but inactivity and obesity is definitely one that's having an impact on our readiness capabilities. And so um, that's really the driving force behind doing what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, we want to make those positive impacts and try to do that. So we have a unified commitment under MCOM's leadership through Healthy Army Communities to do just that. Uh, with the goal of making healthier choices easy, but also likely um, in everything and every day that you um, are on our Army garrisons. So we're doing that by focusing on three key areas, active living being one. Now active living is the environment, infrastructure, but it's also physical activity and how those three work together um, in cohesion to provide that opportunity for physical, act physical activity to take place on our garrisons. The second is in culture and behavior change. Um, that's about education and awareness. It's, it's great that we make options available, but if people aren't aware and they don't understand the reasons why they need to participate in it, um, it's really for naught. So there really is a focus on that and making sure that we've got opportunities that um, are challenging, but also incentivizing our, our customer base, our community members to be a part of. The third is the area of healthy eating, of course, the food environment. Um, that's the easy one for us all to go to because it's something we do at least for some of us, three times a day, sometimes more. Um, but making sure that we have an environment that supports that and that healthier choices are available. Um, we're looking at nutrient-rich, healthier choices. And you'll hear me talk a lot about healthier versus healthy. And that's because we all have our own definition of what's healthy. Um, what's healthy for you might not be healthy for me, at least in my opinion, right? So it, this is really about challenging each other, about taking your next step in your health journey. What's the healthier choice for you and then making sure that we have those options available for you to take those choices and to make that move. And so uh, that really is a guiding force for everyone as we've kind of moved forward in this um, kind of overall commitment. Starting with the, uh, the active living environment, um, you know, looking at infrastructure and environment, we've all been on garrisons that have been developed over the last 40, 50 years to be driving communities. And now it's really about how do we shift that focus and really drive our communities to be more walkable and more bikeable uh, and friendly in that aspect for that active living component. And so in part of that, we're working with Army Public Health Center through tools that are available to us, such as the Military Promoting Activities Tool, um, which measures the infrastructure environment's ability to support active living choices. So if you have hiking and biking trails, do they take you somewhere? Do they connect you to something? Are they well maintained? Are they well lit? Those type of things. And then using that tool and that data set then to guide the area development plans um, that then shape the decisions that our master planners are making for our garrisons 30, 40 years down the road. So we're super excited about the work that's being done there because we realize it's not about just the change today, it's the change for the future and really laying that foundation for our youth as they grow up and make the decision to serve in their country. Um, along that same lines, it's also about, you know, I talked about master planners working with DAG9 to ensure that regulation is in place that guides those master planners to make sure that they have opportunities for community gardens, that when you're building a new barrack space, that, it, that it's in close proximity to recreation facilities and the things that they need to stay active and stay connected. Um, right down to even building designs, like when you walk in the front door, don't put the elevator bank right there, put the stairs there, make them walk around the corner and down the hall to get to the elevators. You know, it's just simple little things that we sometimes take for granted that by working together and putting in regulations and policies that drive those kind of things really will shape our future as we look at um, the possibilities when it comes to active living. And, and just to brag a little bit, um, even simple things like repurposing spaces that we already have on our garrison. So for instance, at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, we're piloting a, a scenario where 18 holes of the existing golf course uh, which was underutilized. We've now taken nine of those to be foot golf and nine to be disc golf. Again, just fun, exciting ways to get families out there doing something different than maybe they hadn't done before, but we're just not letting that space go to waste. You know, opening the trails for the, uh, for the stroller clubs to use and those kind of things. So it's, again, it's about repurposing as well as identifying what we can do in the future uh, to really make uh, these things uh, exciting and possible. The healthy eating environment, of course, um, that's probably been the most exciting aspect of what we've been able to do in the last four years together as a team. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed, maybe you didn't realize it, but in the exchange alone, when you walk into the Express now, you'll see BFIT end caps with healthier choices available. You see healthier choices labels on the aisles of the Express store. 
four years ago that didn't exist. And that was all because of this partnership of Healthy Army Communities that the exchange is committed to doing those things and to making those changes to make sure that healthier choices are available. Right down to looking at national brands that we have on our garrison. As uh, contracts have expired or underperforming brands have come to the front, um, taking that opportunities to bring in national brands that maybe have a healthier menu uh, availability for them. And so it's a strong commitment of theirs and we're very proud that they're doing that. And it's aligned with what we're doing in Healthy Army Communities. For our commissaries, two years ago they rolled out the Nutrition Guide Program. I don't know if you know this, but our grocery stores, the commissaries, are the only ones in the country that have done the work for you and provide labeling on the shelves in the commissary that identify the healthier choices with the green thumbs up that you'll see if you go in there. Um, and so you don't have to pick up every single box to look at the choices. They've done that work for you, they present it for you, and that's just exciting, great work. Again, it's about making healthy choice easy. Um, and so we're excited about what they're doing that with also their dietitian approved grab and goes and some of their meal solutions that you have online uh, as a resource as well. When it comes to Army G4, um, and what we're doing in our dining facilities, the Joint Culinary Center of Excellence has done a lot of work in the last couple of years. You know, we had Go for Green, then we went Go for Green 2.0. Now we're on Go for Green Army. Again, it's about putting in new recipes, making sure options are available for our vegetarians and vegans and gluten-free, um, and making sure that our young single soldiers that are eating in those dining facilities have those healthier choices available. Again, they can't make that choice if it's not there. And so uh, we're really excited about the work they're doing there, along with also putting in some mobile feeding options. Um, as well as a uh, um, uh, kiosk as well. For family and MWR, we have a 25% requirement now on our food and beverage operations that all menus have to have 25% of it to be a healthy menu item that meets a nutritional requirement. Um, was unheard of a few years ago and now that's in place. And again, it's about putting in that infrastructure to support the overall environment. To right down to a healthy food truck pilot, our own grab and go for healthy stuff. Um, so again, it's exciting stuff. And then together, all of the stakeholders, we're working on a new program for campus style dining, which is gonna allow our meal card holders to eat outside the dining facility using their meal entitlement because we as stakeholders have finally put together a, a foundation where healthy choices can be made. So now it makes sense that for them to follow that university campus dining model and be able to use that meal entitlement at other places outside the dining facility because now we have committed healthier choices available. So again, a lot of great work being done in the heating, uh, healthy eating environment uh, and we're just really excited about all that they have going on there. Um, on the culture behavior change, you know, again, it's about education awareness and there's a lot of different partners that are involved in that. But one of the things I did want to share with everyone, um, you know, MedCom for a couple of years now have had the um, uh, uh, tobacco-free campuses model. And so we're using that model and we're saying, how can we take that one step further? What's the next healthy step uh, when it comes to for tobacco sensation on our garrisons? And so we're looking at working with our garrisons uh, to identify zones where maybe we have child and youth activities, recreation activities, it's a three or four block radius where those facilities are all around each other, and then creating a tobacco-free zone. Again, with the, the intent of shading our youth from the, uh, the behavior of tobacco use. Um, so it'll probably be years, it took us 50 years to wear a seatbelt, so it'll probably take us a few years to get to where we're completely tobacco-free. Um, but if we can take that one next step and create some tobacco-free zones, I think it's a great win for everybody and it just keeps the conversation moving forward. Uh, in a great positive way. And so really what it comes down to is um, how do you get involved? Um, you know, a lot of what we've done is because we heard your voices. Family said, we'll make a healthy choice if you make it available. And so the stakeholders have ponied up, they've done the hard work, they've started laying the foundation to make those healthier choices available. So now what I need you to do is make your next step, take that next healthy choice, Go support your MWR facilities that are providing it. Go to the exchange, go to your commissary. Uh, support those young soldiers that are eating the dining facilities. Encourage them to make the healthy choice because together um, we have an opportunity to really shape the future of where we're going uh, for our communities. Each and every one of you is a part of a healthy Army community. I'm proud to be a member of a healthy Army community. And so uh, uh, take your next step, make the healthy choice uh, because if you take it, you might like it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here today. You might have wondered when I was introduced uh, why I'm here, since I'm not part of the Army Public Health Center. Um, I direct the Military Family Research Institute at Purdue University, um, but I'm not here representing them either. Uh, I'm here today because I recently served on a National Academies of Science panel 
uh, which was asked uh, with uh, the Office of Military Community and Family Policy as its client to think about the military family readiness system for the future. So our client was from OSD, therefore we weren't talking specifically about any uh, specific uh, branch of service. This was intended to be uh, a big picture look. And in the brief time that I have with you today, I'm going to just share one conclusion, offer you one piece of food for thought as an appetizer uh, for a much longer report and set of recommendations. Uh, it's downloadable for free. My last slide uh, has where you can go uh, to do that. Let me just explain that uh, like many other, oops, like many other um, reports that you have seen, it included some of the usual kinds of activities you might expect, uh, careful examination of the existing scientific literature, public hearings, perhaps some of you were there. Uh, we also commissioned papers um, by other scholars and we invited comments from a large list of uh, military serving nonprofits, um, organizations of military members and spouses, uh, and others. Uh, we also had lots of arguments on the committee, as you might imagine. Imagine you get 14 or so academics and practitioners in a room. Uh, there were raised voices sometimes. Thankfully, the National Academies books dinners at nice places, so you can uh, get back together and start to like each other again over dinner. Uh, but vigorous discussions and uh, a lot of work, and hopefully the report is useful to you. I think one fundamental recognition, uh, which we just assumed to be true in a way, although we also know that the literature supports this, and of course you all know it too, but I want to acknowledge it because we think it is so important. Uh, families are not just the supporting cast for service members. Families are partners in the production of military service. Um, and so all of our work was really predicated with that idea. Families stand side by side with their service members, not behind them, and not off in some other place. Uh, and I know you all know that, but I felt that it was important uh, to say today This is such an obvious statement. Families are always changing. And yet, when we look around our society, it's the case that many of our organizations and our policies and our practices and our programs uh, operate in ways that don't necessarily acknowledge this very simple statement as much as they would like. And so I wanted to uh, give you just a tiny bit of information about that, uh, how families have been changing. today. Cohabitation is as common as marriage. Today, marriage and parenthood are decoupling. Over 40% of children in American society are now born outside of marriage. Young adults entering the military today have experienced more family transitions in their own past and in the lives of their families um, than was the case in service members joining in a prior generation. Family uh, diversity is growing. Family instability is also growing. Family diversity is not necessarily a problem. Family instability is potentially a problem and appears to have um, significant uh, negative implications for children under some circumstances. Even more concerning is that the behavior in our society by different groups of people is diverging by education. And so highly educated people are more likely to marry each other. They're more likely to get married. They're more likely to stay married. They're more likely to have their children inside marriage. Less educated people, less likely to marry, more likely to divorce, more likely to have their children outside marriage, more likely to have children from multiple partners. Both of these realities exist. And one of the reasons that people are concerned in particular or think that this um, type of behavior among less educated people is growing is because of financial instability. Let me illustrate uh, just a little bit this point, sorry. Here. So for, between 1970, so right before the beginning of the all-volunteer force, and 2014, here's what we saw in changes in U.S. society 
uh, in the growth or shrinkage of different kinds of family forms. So married couples with children fell 26%. Every other family form grew. Household, householders with partners and or children in their household grew 220%. Now, among military families, all of those blue arrows still represent a relatively small portion of the overall to the extent that we know. Um, and married couple families are still a very large uh, percentage of the group. But they're shrinking. They're shrinking uh, as a percentage. And so the dilemma is, uh, which families do you serve? Do you sort of hold fast and say, no, we think the best kind of family is the family that fits through this box, or do we acknowledge the families that we really have? And over the last 30 years, and potentially in the next 30 years, what you will see is military programs, practices, and policies gradually diverging from the families that the military actually has and covering potentially a smaller and smaller percentage of the families that you actually have. And today, there are families who are invisible. You have families that we don't really know much about. The uh, spouse survey that we just heard about was for spouses. Well, what about those 220% increase in unmarried partners uh, with children? You have those folks too, but they're not in uh, these sorts of surveys for sometimes very good reasons. Um, but not having any information at all uh, might prevent good decision making. And so one of our recommendations was uh, that we really need to try to understand better the diversity of the families that you really have that are really in the military. And the recognition, the committee recognizes fully that you can't treat everyone like you now treat spouses. You can't, you can't incorporate everybody under that big tent. It would be uh, impractical and too expensive. But we think that there are reasons to be able to ask these three questions. Who provides care and support for service members, both married and unmarried? Who should be the targets of the military family readiness system? And most important, which parts of the system can address which part of service members' support systems? Uh, this last slide, if I can get it to come up, but if not, I'm sure it will be posted. Uh, you can see at the National Academies, uh, you can download the report there. My email address is really easy. You can just email me and I will send you the link. Thank you for your attention. I, have on, I only have one slide, so it should be really easy to um, navigate this can clicker. Um, you know, at the end of my signature block at work, I have a quote that says, success means we go to sleep at night knowing that our talents and abilities were used in a way that served others. You know, our spouses, I'm a military spouse, so our spouses serve, and I think that uh, we serve as well. And while the way, that, the way that we serve is different, it absolutely requires us to be resilient. Um, you know, even knowing that, that it requires this resiliency, um, and hosting resiliency events for military children with the Military Child Education Coalition, you know, I'm a master resilient trainer, um, et cetera. When they asked me to um, be on this panel three days ago, um, I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say because I felt like this was uh, a little bit different than when you're up there teaching or, or you're hosting an event. And, uh, and honestly, I'm super, super nervous. So, um, so I wrote talking points, right? I got feedback from someone that um, I trusted and then I edited those talking points. Um, and then uh, there I was yesterday picking out my uh, favorite baking book because on Friday all my kids tested positive for the flu. Not contagious, just FYI. Right, yeah, right? So um, didn't even know it. Um, anyway, and out fell this note and it was written on packing paper and y'all know what that is, right? Brown packing paper folded up everywhere. Um, and it said something, it, was, it said this. Um, it said, you are the best battle buddy a girl could ask for. I might cry. I'm sorry. Right, so you are the best battle buddy a girl could ask for. You are so strong and such an inspiration, and I am excited to visit. Yes, I invited myself and beer. I do drink beer. Love, Kelly. Right. And I have three more of those written on packing paper, and they were stuffed inside uh, packing boxes three years ago when we made our move to APG. 
Um, and when I say we, it was my three, we have four children. It was my three younger children and I. Um, my husband was deployed to Afghanistan and the army decided to throw us uh, another curveball. I know, yeah, I'll explain it all later. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, um, and so with that curveball, um, you know, my husband and I over FaceTime in Afghanistan decided that I, I should take a job in Aberdeen Proving Ground, right, if I could get one. Um, and I did a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. So I packed up all three children by myself because this wasn't a military ordered move to come here. Um, and we moved to APG. Um, you know, and so I just want to say that um, I want to pause for one second, too, because this was not in my notes, but I was listening to, you know, panel one and everybody else that was talking earlier today. And, you know, as I'm writing this, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to write about, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, I, this I put together Thursday, so I apologize. But they were like, what is resiliency? I'm like, mm, right. Um, so community, right. Purpose, contentment, impact. Um, you know, for me, it's really about community. And I just think that everybody on the on panel one and you know um, all the other research that has been done is really just um, reiterates that for me um, how important community is. So I, I feel humbled and honored to be able to talk just a teeny bit about what community means to me as a military spouse. Um, you know, so as military spouses, I think resiliency means that we take every adversity, every move every deployment. Uh, my husband's been on three combat deployments and he's been on three hardship tours and um, multiple TDYs and I don't have to tell any of you spouses out there anything about that. Um, but we take every deployment and every new school and every best friendship turn into a long distance relationship, right? Um, and we do what we have to do, right? Because our soldiers need us too and our kids need us too and we just do it. And I don't think that's ever gonna change and I think that's fantastic and it speaks a lot about the strength of military spouses. Um, but I also believe that resiliency is more than just bouncing back from adversity and doing what we have to do. You know, I believe it's about community, impact, contentment, and purpose. Um, so today I'm going to talk just a little bit about that type of resiliency. All right. Because before all of this, before becoming a military spouse, a mother of four, um, you know, having a career, um, I couldn't stand people like you. Right, and people like you, like you dress not, no, I'm being serious, right, laughing. <laughs> um, people who are dressed nice, right? Um, people in uniform, ironic, I know, because I'm married to a man in uniform, um, right? But if you looked like you were successful, if you weren't wearing dirty clothes, if you had a place to live, I despised you. And I despised you because I didn't think that you were there when I needed you. You know, and then, and then one day, at a coffee um, in Vilsack, Germany, with, when we were stationed with 201st Field Support Battalion, my husband's uh, commander's wife came up to me and said, you know, something happened to me yesterday, Elizabeth, and I really wanted to share it with you because I really knew that you would get it. And she shared this something with me, and it was really personal and impactful for her in her, in her personal life. And, um, and I think that was one of the first times I felt like someone besides my husband uh, saw me not the daughter of a drug addict single mother um, who only had dirty clothes, was on the run all the time. And I thought, wow, to be a part of a community like this. You know, and that's where I thought um, community really matters. You know, before then I was like, I don't trust anybody. I don't want anything to do with anybody, right? I'll do it on my own, right? And then spouses like you changed that for me. You change that. You know, so you see, resiliency isn't just about bouncing back from adversity. You know, it's rising above all of that. Those things that you have no control over, it's learning to love and be content with yourself and with um, the life you've been given. It's finding your purpose, and whether that be in your volunteer work or your career or both, right? And then it's building that through community, like the ones that we have. You know, as military spouses, I feel that we're blessed to be a part of one of the greatest communities on the planet. I do. I know that's a little biased, but I believe it. You know, we know how to encourage and inspire each other. Um, we share love and loss and fear with each other. You know, and because of that, I don't believe that I could be where I am today, that we can make the impact on the communities that we do everywhere we go. You know, and I'm beyond, beyond proud um, to love a man that defends a country where a girl like me, right, abused, abandoned, emancipated at 16, 
you know, can be a part of such an incredible, incredible community that makes an impact wherever we go. So I think leaving today, I'm, I'm exactly at zero seconds, right? Look at that. Um, leaving today, I want to just say thank you um, to all the other military spouses out there who make an impact wherever they go. So thank you. So we could have just had Elizabeth up here. <laughs> but with that, can I take any questions for our, our STEAM panel? Yes. <laughs> for our online people, they can hear you better that way. Thank you. Okay. Elizabeth, thank you. I just I want to tell you that I have a 19-year-old, mm -hmm. and she went to 10 schools. Mm -hmm. Our motto, I guess you could say, would be, we're Army. We're an Army family. We can do whatever. We, we, can, we can handle any adversity. When I dropped her off at school, she was having some issues, and she goes, Mom, I'll handle it. I'm an Army brat. I can handle it. But thank you. For our um, two gentlemen, I actually have two questions. One, with the new electric health records. I know the program is actually being redone. Is the new computer program going to read the old computer program? Because I know that's, that's part of the problem right now that, that we are seeing. And the other question I have is with the health, with the um, school age services, are we doing any classes for kids to try to get them away from vaping? We talk about tobacco-free zones. Are we going to do vaping-free zones? The high school my middle child went to had four arrests and one death two weeks ago from vaping on, on a tobacco-free area. I'll, I'll answer your first question first because I'll talk about your second question for a long time. Uh, in terms of the new electronic health record, uh, it's called Genesis is the term. It is a commercial off-the-shelf product, uh, which one will make it easier to share with the private sector. They also use it. So some of the problems I've talked about here where not being able to get data uh, hopefully will go away when that's fully rolled out. It is also uh, the same electronic health record that the VA is using. So it's going to make record sharing across the larger medical enterprise within the United States easier, and it will incorporate legacy data. Uh, from the current ALTA. Uh, second question is uh, basically electronic cigarettes, vaping is covered by the Army's tobacco policies. We don't make a distinction between a cigarette and an electronic cigarette. And so any place that's tobacco free within the Army is a no vaping uh, situation right now. And so we're in the process of we have educational materials already uh, that can be used uh, in terms of whether it's child use services, health education. I know what we do is that we, we have uh, four soldiers, essentially a, you know, don't vape either kind of thing. Now we are tilting against cultural windmills right now. Um, the current epidemic or the outbreak we have, there's over a thousand people within the United States that have fallen ill. Uh, a couple of dozen that have died. I'm, it's, I'm sorry to hear about that. With with you know, that's touched you, um, and it's one of those things that we are, we're trying to chase it. The one point I will make: I'd be remiss if I didn't do do this. For people to think that uh, mass marketed electronic cigarettes are somehow safer than uh, vape juice that you buy at a, a pop up, you're deluding yourself. All vape juice is dangerous. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, sold by a company that has, you know, enough money to advertise on the NFL. You know, it, it just doesn't matter. So vaping right now is an inherently dangerous act. Uh, in fact, I'm worried. I think vaping currently today in the United States may be more dangerous than smoking cigarettes because people don't die usually after one cigarette. They have, they can die right now, you know, with the first time they vape. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. Yeah. There's a question right up here in the front. Yeah. Thank you. Hold on, he's going to get the microphone to you. 
Talk about healthy choices and having like the food corner with some bananas or, you know, um, healthy options and what you consider healthy. It's like an opinion or there, there's really so much confusion out there right now of what is healthy to eat and what is not, right? There's the big plant-based movement and then there's that recent article in the Annals of Medicine saying, oh, processed meat and red meat are fine, you know, they, even though if you look at all the studies they cited, it kind of says it's not. Um, so there's different guidelines that have been issued by the government and the um, American Heart Association, et cetera. Is the Army going to, and, and the confusing diets, you know, the keto, the paleo, the quick weight loss using, you know, burning the fat and all these things are going on. There's so much marketing and misinformation and confusion. It's kind of like, reminds me of the tobacco industry when, uh, you know, before the warnings were on cigarettes, you know, is bacon carcinogenic or is it not? Uh, there's a lot of research out there. Is the arm or the military even going to eventually somehow take a stand to give some help to our community to figure out what is healthy and what is not? We see articles in Time magazine, oh, butter's back, you know, bacon, you know, eggs are great. You know, it, it's so confusing. Can the leaders give some direction, you know, pick is hyper, hyperlipidemia really a situation, you know, that it was for the last 50 years? Cardi cardiovascular disease is our number one killer. Um, do we need to get a handle on this? We see people very fit. They, they run, they do the Army 10 miler, and then you see these same people, unfortunately, having heart attacks. Um, so there begs some help with not using opinions and Google searches to figure out what's healthy and not. So I'm going to uh, make a comment, and I'm looking back at Colonel Dietrich Tehan, um, and then I'm going to pass it over to our panelists. And the reason, thank you for bringing that up. And actually, Ms. Barron had one time we did a panel just on those types of questions because it's so, it's so confusing, right? It's huge. And the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, and they want, they want you to buy their products, right? They want the soldiers to um, use different diet plans and family members, and they, they market to, um, to, the, to the soldiers and to the families. Um, Colonel Tahan, about, I don't know how many, maybe five years ago, six years ago, came up with the plan called the Performance Triad. And really that was to look at sleep, activity, and nutrition from a very holistic perspective. Um, we have very fit um, soldiers and very fit family members that maybe don't eat so healthy or don't sleep so well. We have a very underslept um, army. And she actually has someone working for her, Colonel Capaldi, who I just met from Walter Reed Army Institute for Research, which she's a commander who is phenomenal, um, doing phenomenal research in the area of sleep. So what we're trying to promote, instead of saying, you know, don't do keto or, don't, you know, and Tim will talk a little bit about that, is, you know, this holistic perspective that you need to think of all three together. So if you're physically active, um, you need to be thinking about your nutrition and your sleep as well. So we've got a lot of information out there. We have a, a site. We are working with commanders on having people understand that idea of sleep, activity, and nutrition together are going to increase your performance as a family, uh, as an individual, and as a, um, and as a soldier. And actually, that started under um, General Jorjo's uh, lead. And so we're, 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 we're continuing that effort, General Jorjo. So um, uh, I'll turn it over to either Mr. Rest or Tim to answer a little bit more on that. You, you know, I'll just say that. Um, DOD has a food and nutrition subcommittee that, that meets regularly with all of the services and, and all of the stakeholders that are in the food environment. And so we realize there's all of those education and awareness aspects out there, that there's sometimes conflicting messages. The important thing is, is that we're coming together and having kind of those internal conversations about how do we move this forward? What are the right answers? What is the message we want to carry forward? And now with the alignment and we have the Defense Health Agency kind of bringing us all together, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way in which we haven't had in the, in the past, it's allowing that conversation to move forward and, and put into a way that we can message to our, um, to our communities and to our individuals. And so we, we don't have all the answers yet, and it's by no means a perfect scenario, but again, it's about taking that next step. And so just recognizing the issue and the situation and then coming together and having the difficult conversations, holding each other accountable, like I said, um, and, and trying to lay a foundation so that um, wherever you go on our installations that we know at least the healthier choices are available. Um, they may not be the perfect choices, but at least they're uh, available and that people can have those. And so uh, it's a great conversation. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to rise above 
and lead really the nation um, in, the, in a way forward for, for health and nutrition, absolutely. And, and what I would add is that most of the nutritional epidemiological studies out there are, are garbage. Uh, and I, I mean that so, somewhat jokingly, is that uh, they are either very small samples, uh, very limited time period, uh, very restrictive diets that uh, people are really incapable of, of keeping for longer and longer and longer times. And so to make broad observations based upon the study of the week, um, we, have, we have lots of times where, you know, what did you read over the weekend? We bring it in. And so whether it was coffee this week or, or butter or bacon or a whole vegan diet or any, any ones, there are problems with the data as it goes on. Uh, I looked at, for me personally, I look to history. We look at what people have been eating. Uh, and you, you mentioned The Blue Zones as, the, as, a, as a great book for those of you who have not read it. Um, every culture has figured a way out to eat to thrive. And I, I would, that's what I encourage people to do is, you know, look at what your grandparents ate. Uh, and uh, particularly if they lived a very long time, definitely look at what your grandparents ate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, now, if they didn't live that long, then maybe a different story. But, and, or look at what their parents ate or their grandparents ate, you know, before they came into the United States. So, so my question is reference Genesis. So I'll give you a little bit of a backstory, and then I'll ask the question. Um, I, uh, recently, I lost my son going through the med board process. Um, one of the problems that was identified during the 15-6 that was conducted was, you know, he was seeing a VA doctor, he was seeing his pain care manager, he was seeing his primary care manager, but because they were all on different systems and because he was being treated for physical ailments and being asked questions about behavioral health issues, none of it was connected together. So when this person's treating them and this person's treating them, they're not seeing the true picture. Is Genesis going to fix that? General Blank. General Blank, I, I can answer what I've been told, but I did. Yeah, fix is a, is a challenging word. So the, the challenge with existing systems is that they are interoperable, but it takes significant effort to do so. So could the practitioners, all that you mentioned, could they have seen all the notes? The answer is yes, they could have. It just takes significant effort to get into each of the different systems to do so. The advantage of MHS Genesis is the platform is the same. The note structure is the same. The interoperability is the same. So it becomes extraordinarily easier, simpler, uh, sensical for the providers to look in the same electronic health record to see it. Would it have solved the problem for your son, sir? I don't know. And, and I'm, I apologize for the entire United States military for what your family has gone through to get to this place. But tools support decision making, and Genesis will be a much better tool to support the clinicians who are taking care of people like your son. Thank you. So unfortunately, uh, thank you, sir, for answering that question. We're out of time. Uh, we'll be here on the side if anyone wants to talk, and of course, keep your questions coming, and we'll make sure to answer them when Ms. Barron gets them to us. So thank you for your time. I'll give it back to you, Ms. Barron. Well, that panel was well worth the wait. Thank you all so very, very much. And come back tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you.